join us if you know the words.
God, thank you for your presence, for your love in our lives. And even if we're not aware of it, even if we can't see it or feel it, help us to claim the truth that your love is surrounding us in the midst of our life and the things that are going on inside and outside. Your love is surrounding us, and we are in good hands. Amen. Amen. Well, I'd like to welcome you to Roots and Branches online and live. Um, we're so glad to have a live band back as we've kind of figured out the personal distancing situation in our world and um, are taking all the necessary precautions to make sure that we are being safe as we gather, but also uh, rejoicing in the fact that we have got, a, we got the band back together. And uh, I know the band is happy to be here, and I'm happy that you have joined us here, wherever you're coming from today. Thanks for being part of what we are doing here at Roots and Branches as we are growing deeper in faith and reaching out in love. That's what the Roots and Branches are about with this whole situation, um, finding ways that we can have a depth of soul and of uh, spirit that can actually give us the strength we need to reach out and offer grace and love and generosity to this world. I want to direct you one last time to our website. There's a link in the description of this video. Um, if you are new to this Roots and Branches deal, um, that's a great place for you to go so you can get connected, stay connected, find out what we're doing to care for our community and for our world, and find out how you can continue to grow your roots deeper in faith and in God's love. Uh, one thing I want to mention briefly is that in this current situation, this climate of the world that we're in, um, one of the ways that we have really celebrated caring for our community uh, over the last year is that we support a, an organization called Sheridan Story uh, that, feeds <laughs> that feeds hungry kids. Uh, it, it provides meals that kids can take home over the weekend uh, for, for families that might be food insecure. And we've been su supporting uh, the kids that need help at Wilson Elementary that's just a few blocks away from our church here in Anoka. And they are going to have a bigger need this year than ever before. Um, the cost of meals is going to go up, and also the number of kids that we're going to need to support is going up. And so if you want to make an extra contribution to Sheridan's story uh, through Roots and Branches, I encourage you to click through to our giving link on our webpage, and then in the note when you give, it's through PayPal, when you give on our PayPal, add a note that says Sheridan Story, and then we'll know to dedicate those funds to Sheridan Story and feed those kids that might not have food on the weekend without our help. Uh, today, we're going to start a new series uh, that's called Commonplace Sacred Space. And we're going to be talking about how we can find the holy in everyday things. Uh, because right now, it's not like you can walk into a sanctuary with a grand cathedral and uh, stained glass windows right? So many spaces like that are closed and inaccessible. All we have, all we've had for months and months is just our everyday life, the things around us, our living room and our family room and the people that are closest to us wherever you happen to live. And so how is it that we find God even there? How is it that these commonplace things can be a portal so that we can find access to the holy so that we can touch something meaningful and deep and also grand and beyond us, even in these everyday things. Um, next week, we are going to be welcoming uh, our good friend and uh, resident prophet, Patrick. Uh, he's going to be talking about water, something we interact with every day. And how does water open up our hearts to God? And today, I'm going to be talking about bread. Bread is a thing that is so common, so essential across so many cultures that it's easy to just take for granted. In fact, bef so before I left my home this morning, I just grabbed one of every kind of bread that I had. And here's what I found. I found, like, obviously, like, straight up white bread. We got a hamburger bun, technically also white bread. Uh, we've got an English muffin. Cheerio. All right. And... Uh, 
100% whole wheat bread and also a tortilla, all right? Still technically bread, right? So that's just my house on a random Sunday morning and we have at least five or six kinds of bread sitting around. And the weirdest thing about bringing up all this bread and to bring it with me this morning is that I can't eat any of it. <laughs> um, my wife Jenny and I are avoiding carbs right now. And so all of this bread that I have with me, beautiful and delicious as it may be, is off limits. So uh, it's really only after you've deprived yourself of bread for a few days or a few weeks that you realize exactly how precious. <laughs> how precious a thing bread really is. Uh, the great... The great chef James Beard once said, good bread is the most fundamentally satisfying of all foods. And good bread with butter, with fresh butter, the greatest of feasts. And if you have a favorite kind of bread or a great memory attached to baking bread or eating bread, I want you to mention it in the comments uh, below right now. Just start talking about bread. Start getting hungry. Maybe you got to throw a little toast in the toaster right now just because I'm sorry. Um, but we have such an attachment to bread, whether it's the smell of fresh baked bread or the warm dinner rolls at Thanksgiving or the sound of your mom scraping butter on your toast before sending you off to school in the morning. Bread is universal. And that really speaks to the central role that bread has across cultures and across history. In ancient cultures, the center of town was always the hearth the communal oven where families would meet and bake their bread. And so bread came to represent community and coming together. When we have a meal with others, we call it breaking bread. And when you bake bread, you wind up with this loaf, right, that is meant to be shared. And so bread is also a sign of plenty. When you have bread, you have enough. And the people you share your bread with are the ones you are connected to, the ones you care for. The people you share your bread with are the ones you love. And that brings us to today's scripture from the book of John where Jesus talks about bread. And here's what it says. They asked Jesus, what miraculous sign will you do that we can see and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. Just as, is it, just as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus told them, I assure you, it wasn't Moses who gave the bread from heaven to you, but my Father gives you the bread from heaven. The bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said, Sir, give us this bread all the time. And Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes me will never be thirsty. So let me give you a little context, because this story can be a little confusing if we don't back up a little bit. In the story, as it leads up to these words from Jesus, Jesus had just performed the miracle of feeding 5,000 people with just five loaves of bread and two fish. And when the crowd realized that he, what he had done, the story says the crowd wanted to make Jesus their king by force, if necessary. <laughs> and I don't know exactly how that would have worked, and Jesus did not stick around to find out, because he snuck away to an isolated spot on a mountainside to be alone. Now, this miracle absolutely seems like a big deal, right? But, but why elevate him to king? And, and why would the whole crowd see it this way? They all together were like, this guy fed us, and now he should be our king. So let's think about the situation again from their perspective. Uh, this is a Jewish leader in the first century who stands before a crowd. Thousands of hungry Jewish people suddenly have enough bread for the day. And if you're a Bible person, that might remind you of another story. Because this story in John is almost certainly a very intentional parallel to a story about Moses. If you recall, as Moses led the Hebrew people through the wilderness for 40 years, their main food source was manna. And we just heard that word in the reading. The people 
were complaining that they were hungry. So Moses prayed, and God answered by sending bread from heaven. And each morning, this manna lay out on the ground before them when they awoke, and they had just enough bread for that day. So, imagine being a common Jewish person in Jesus' day. In case you don't know, if that's the situation where you found yourself in the first century, you were politically powerless. You were marginalized by your own priests and your own kings. You were generally unable to practice your own religion because you didn't have the money for sacrifices. And you don't have the money because your leaders are taxing you up to 90% of your income. And if I was in that situation, I know I'd lose faith in my religious systems real fast. If, if they all said that this terrible lot in life was exactly the way God wanted it to be. But, put yourself in that situation. And you're still holding on to hope because your scriptures are filled with these stories of God showing up for God's people, especially when things are at their worst. And then, one day, you're on your way to to fetch water or to go to the market, and you see this crowd gathering over on a hillside. And you go to check out the commotion, and you realize that it's Jesus. And you've heard people talking about him. Some say he's a prophet. Some say he's just another rabbi, just a teacher. And, and, And you realize that everyone is passing around bread. And the light bulb goes off. That this, this Jesus, he's like a new Moses. And what did Moses do? He freed his people from tyranny. He led them to the promised land. And that, and that was the world you lived in. And then you had this encounter. Wouldn't you run to make Jesus your king too? And so when we meet up with Jesus a few verses later, the crowds have tracked him down after his little escape act, and they're trying to figure out if he really is the new Moses. And that's, that's why they asked, what miraculous sign will you do that we can believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. And Jesus knows they either want to make him king or they just want more bread because bread is great. We have established this fact. And so he moves the conversation on to bigger things. Jesus says it wasn't Moses that gave the people bread in the wilderness. It was God. And God is still giving you bread from heaven, but now it's in the form of the one that God has sent to you. And this person, this bread from heaven, gives life to the world. And the people around Jesus say, yes, give us this bread. And Jesus says, whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Now, I think it's pretty obvious Jesus is speaking in metaphor here. Jesus is saying that there's a kind of hunger that you feel someplace other than your stomach, right? And whatever that hunger is, Jesus has a lifelong solution for it. Like I said before, when you have bread, you have enough. I heard a familiar story on on a TV show the other day. You've heard a story maybe a dozen stories just like this. A teenager, a teenage girl's family uh, learned that she was gay, and she was immediately kicked out of the house. No conversation, no, we love you anyway, just immediate, swift condemnation. This young woman spent years after that, floating from couch to couch without a sense of belonging, and when she was asked whether she thought she'd ever have a sense of family again, she said, I don't know if I'm the kind of person who has a family. And I think this is, this is one of the kinds of hunger that Jesus is talking about when he says that there's no need to hunger anymore. Remember what bread stands for? The people you share your bread with are the ones you're connected to, the, the ones you care for. The people you share your bread with are the ones you love. And Jesus sat on a hillside with five thousand people and they passed the bread from one to another and in that simple act as they handed the bread to the next person down the line they were saying to each other I'm connected to you I care for you you are loved 
And what do these things add up to, if not family? The church, the whole church, (laughs) is the family of those who follow Jesus. And that's why the earliest days of Christianity, people called one another brother and sister. And when we open our eyes to the wide open, relentless acceptance of God's love, we realize that our sibling connection goes beyond just the people who go to my church or the people who call themselves Christians. We are brothers and sisters and siblings to all people everywhere. We are surrounded by a world full of hungry people, now more than ever. We are starved for community. We feel the the pangs deep within for someone who we can let our guard down with. We are hungry for someone who we can rely on, someone who will turn to us when they're in need too. And Jesus says, whoever comes to me will never go hungry in that way. I believe with all my heart that if if someone becomes a follower of Jesus, an actual follower, someone who models their way of life after the life of Jesus, that their spiritual hunger will be satisfied. But I also believe that Jesus came to do more than make you feel good about things. Jesus came to bring people together to form a community that reconstitutes what it means to be a family. Think about it. Around, Around his table of closest friends... Jesus had religious zealots and tax collectors, working class fishermen and prostitutes. Do you think there'd be room for a girl kicked out of her home because of her sexuality? I do. Do you think there'd be room around Jesus' table for someone like you? I do. Because when you have bread, you have enough. And this is why Roots and Branches is growing vegetables, right, and handing them out to our neighbors. This is why we're going to increase our commitment to Sheridan's story, feeding kids in need at Wilson Elementary. This is why we fed volunteers at a distribution center in Minneapolis the week of George Floyd's death. Because sometimes being the bread the world needs means literally feeding people. But sometimes it means opening our hearts and our doors so that people of all backgrounds can see with their own eyes that family can be a reality within this community of acceptance. Because when you have bread, you have enough. And when you're offering bread, you're saying to whoever receives it, you are enough. So right now, Take a moment. I want you to think of a person or a community or an organization where there might not be enough. A place where there might be someone who doesn't yet know that they are enough. And hold hold that in your heart. Take a moment. If you want to, you can mention it in the comments of this video. And this week, every time you touch a piece of bread... Every time you touch a piece of bread, every time you have a bite of a sandwich or scrape butter over your toast in the morning, remember those that don't have enough. Remember your calling. Remember that God has sent the bread the world's, the, that the world needs. And that bread, that bread is Jesus, but that bread is also you. Because thinking back to our story, as that, as that bread made its way around the crowd of 5,000, there was no qualifying exam that anyone had to pass. No standard for morality that anyone had to live up to to eat the bread. It was simply given. For most of us, the family we were born into accepted us and loved us. We don't have to earn belonging. It was simply given. And Jesus said that the bread that the world needs is the one whom God has sent. People of God, I'm here this morning to say that God has sent you. You are the body of Christ. The sign that family can be a reality for anyone. 
You are the embodiment of compassion and acceptance. You are the bread the world needs. And when there's bread, there's enough. If you have bread handy, we are going to celebrate communion this morning, wherever you happen to be. And uh, if you're a church person, you might recall from the Lord's Prayer, maybe you prayed it every Sunday morning as you, when you were a kid, give us this day our daily bread. And when Jesus taught us that prayer, he was referring back to this same story of Moses in the wilderness and this divine miracle of bread that was enough for each and every day. And Jesus offers that prayer again, not that God would send bread from heaven, but so that we would see the abundance of God in our everyday lives. That we would realize the love of God gives us enough and that the love of God tells us that we are enough. And that's why on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he shared it with his friends. His friends from all different backgrounds. Some of them weren't great guys. And he shared it with them anyway. And he said, this is my body and it's broken for you. This bread connected them around this table. It made them family and it makes us family. I am not even in the same room with you. I can't even look you in the eye. And I'm telling you this morning, God's love runs deep. And it is offered freely to you without condition. And this bread is a sign. Because where there's bread, there's enough. And we share bread with the people we call family. And God invites us all to be family. And so if you have bread, if you have juice... I invite you now to eat and to drink with thanksgiving, knowing that God's love is enough and that you are enough. Pray with me. God, we thank you for the chance to gather. We thank you for the chance to be family. Even if we're spread all across the community, even if we can't look each other eye to eye, you see us. You hold us dear. And we ask that you would help us to realize just how much we are loved and help us to offer that love to others. Help us to see that we are the bread the world needs. We are the sign of compassion. We are the sign of hope. We are the sign of your unending love. Fill us with the strength and courage we need to make that a reality. Amen. We're going to sing about God's love today. And there's reference of a parable in here about 99 sheep. And if you're unfamiliar with that parable... Uh, Jesus tells the story, a parable of a hundred sheep and one wandered away and the 99 were left and the shepherd left the 99 together safe and went after the one sheep and rescued it. And that's the heart of God. You are worth saving. You are worth loving. You are enough. You are more than enough. loves you and we do too so maybe just meditate on those truths today before you head out with whatever else you're going to do with your day and know that God's love is surrounding you and he cares for you before I spoke a word Good.
thank you for being a part of what God is doing in this world. Even if you're just realizing that today, God put you here for a reason, so that you could be a gift to the world. Just like that bread that gets passed around without exception, you can be an offering of God's love. May you know that, believe that, and embody that deeply today so that you can act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with God. Amen.